I'm going to hook you all into this book right now because we have the Kyle Derrick's voice to introduce this very first line. This is, sorry, not the first line. There's one paragraph and then this is the second paragraph of the book. This is the line. Kyle, please say it with your chest. On Mars, there is not much gravity. So you have to pull the feet to break the neck. They let the loved ones do it. Dang. Welcome back to Tudor Ramble. I am Austin. And I'm Richard. And I am furious at you, Richard. Yep. You know why? Yep. My rising has been reddened. <laughs> I am Red Rising himself. I love this book. We are going to give you spoiler-free and a spoiler-full review on this. We will warn you when spoilers are coming. The reason I am frustrated at you, Richard, yep. is Rich read this book over a year 20 ago. years ago. When you were a little uppity baby, you read this in the cradle. You've had this in the storage for so long. You've read this book, and you didn't tell me. You didn't choke me. You didn't say, Austin, read this, this book. I recommended it to you read this over a year book. ago. It's not my fault that it takes you well over a year to read Stormlight Archive. You shut your damn mouth. I'm just saying, you I've recommended you plenty of books over the years. So, as you can see, <laughs> I am emotionally involved right now. I'm a mess because Red Rising is my, I can officially say this, we're going to give our rating and everything. You'll see it's very high from me. It is one of my favorite books I have ever bloody damn read in my life. And Rich, don't I, you give me that. Face, you facey facer. That's inflated. I, I like the book. Yeah. I'm going to sound like a complete hater. And Pierce Brown, if you're watching, I do really like your book. Pierce Brown, <laughs> it's a really great book. If you're watching. And I'll be honest, your next book, and I think you'd agree with me, is so much better. You improved greatly. And it's a fantastic series. I'm just thinking, like, you improved with time and your writing abilities. I'm not saying, like, right out of the gate, you were the best. It's like you took another book. That's all I'm saying. It's like the series improves, but I'm not you where you're insane. <laughs> you know, we're climbing a mountain and he sees, Austin sees the rise and thinks, oh, that's the peak of the mountaintop. No, there's another mountain to be climbed. Like the mountain goes on. The, You've the, missed. The thing about this book. So this is the first book of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. So there's it's first book of a trilogy, but then there's also a fourth and a fifth book. It's a continuation. That's a con yeah. It's a separate... Th there's a completed trilogy here already out. There's another continuation, and actually the sixth book's coming out this summer, July mm -hmm. 25th, I believe, and then a seventh book's coming out as well. But the reason you're saying that is supposedly this is the worst book of the series. Definitely. And I am flabbergasted by this masterpiece of a book. I just want to say this. I know I might be an outlier here. If you're clicking this video, you're wondering if you should read this book. Yes. Just shut up right now. Stop. Actually, watch. Put Mute this so you don't get spoiled. Just watch it so we can get some ad revenue, you know, get stuff yeah, like yeah. that. But besides that, this book, I want to get right into spoiler-free stuff, and we'll talk about Pierce Brown for a second. Before we do that, we have mm -hmm. a surprise. So we have a special guest named The Kyle Derrick, the voice of God himself. Kyle, how are you? Hello, gentlemen. So, Kyle, that voice oh. you just heard right there. It's he a godly voice. Godly voice. He God is, gave him too many talents. Kyle will be reading lines from the book that we sent to him, and you're you're all in for a treat. We're we're in for a treat. We're gonna sit back, relax, and listen to Kyle's reading of some of these passages. It's amazing. Thank you, Kyle, for for joining us for this. I want to get right into Pierce Brown. Yeah, Pierce Brown. He wrote this book in two months. That's mighty quick. So for any inspire, how's your book coming along, by the way? So for all aspiring writers out there, <laughs> when did you start writing that? What's about a, you know how about I was a saying, year ago? About when I you, think about when you started reading Red Rising, which was you know you were living in twenty years ago. It's, it's been a long time, <laughs> but for writers out there, Pierce Brown was denied six times. He had six novels he wrote that were denied by over one hundred and twenty agents, and he wrote Red Rising in two months in his parents above his parents' garage in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Just banged this out and made a masterpiece. And to you, at least he banged it out and made a good book. He made a very good book, yes. So, enough of Pierce Brown. Spoiler for your review, should you read this book. Do you mind if I take over for this one? Because Go ahead. I, this is I am, yours. I yeah. love this book so much. I just have to say this. Viewers out there, if you, if you have not read this book, this will get you out of your reading slump. If you want a dystopian 
modern sci-fi, this is for you. This is the Hunger Games plus Ender's Game. I like the Hunger Games. I love Ender's Game. They are nothing compared to this book. I love this. Let's pump the brakes here, kid. Let's. This, let's this was my down. my spoiler free review. <laughs> <laughs> it's my episode. Stop ruining my fun. So hey, I'm, I'm feeling a little. I'm feeling a little uh, bitter over the Wheel of Time episode. Okay, I'm I'm gonna push back here. The, a little bit of bias is going into this episode. It's fine. It's fine. You can be wrong. It's okay. Now this book is guttural, fast paced, action pack. It is. I learned so much as a as an aspiring writer about writing itself. This changed my perspective on many things. He's a genius. I have so many good things to say. And for those of you who have been viewing the channel for a long time, you know my favorite author is Brandon Sanderson. My favorite series is the Stormlight Archive. If this series continues after book one to be how much I love book one, this is my new favorite thing. By far. Yeah. It's my new favorite thing. It's because I can't say it yet because I've only read the first book. We're going to be covering all of them. But this book in particular, you follow a character named Darrow. Darrow is 16 years old, which is the only thing pretty much other than the prose that stays rather YA. But after that, it's, it's a dystopian sci-fi. It has very much adult content. So you need to be mature young adult or adult to read this kind of book. Mm -hmm. So we follow Darrow, who is a red. And the Reds are on Mars mining for the thing called Helium-3. Now, A fictional elemental gas. There you go. This fictional elemental gas called Helium-3, which allows you to terraform planets. So Darrow and the other Reds are mining for this Helium-3 in order to allow people to inhabit Mars. That is the whole... Con it is chapter one information. Beyond that, I beg you, do not read the back of the book. I beg you, do not look up any more information other than what I told you there because there's some the backs of the back of the book does spoil quite a bit depending on which version you have mine spoils quite a bit yeah depending on the version it gets into like chapter 12 13 so it's, and there's some shocking things that I didn't read in the back of the book that when I read it were big surprises early mm -hmm. on he accomplishes all this greatness in 125,000 words it is not a long book especially for a fantasy sci-fi that's an average size book mm-hmm and my goodness, the first m moment that I knew this book was for me, and I'm going to hook you all into this book right now, because we have the Kyle Derrick's voice to introduce this very first line. This is, sorry, not the first line. There's one paragraph, and then this is the second paragraph of the book. This is the line. Kyle, please say it with your chest. <laughs> On Mars, there is not much gravity, so you have to pull the feet to break the neck. They let the loved ones do it. Dang. <laughs> On Mars, there's not much gravity. So in order to kill people, you have to yank their legs and they let their loved ones do it. That is the introduction to this gritty, fascinating world. The it's stakes are already... Line. I'm already asking questions. I'm already curious. What a great concept to start with. Mm -hmm. Of Yeah, the gravity on Mars is... Dip. Oh, that's... That's... That's gritty. That yeah. is interesting. That's sadistic. <laughs> I want more. And if you want more of that, read this freaking book. This book is awesome. And I'm getting that all out because when we get more into spoiler section, it's going to be more serious discussion. It's also going to be more. Uh, I'm going to start it's taking over negative. in the spoiler section because I have my critiques. You have your critiques and all of them are invalid no matter what they are. It doesn't matter. Listen. All of you read this book with the highest of rec one of the highest recommendations I can give. And here's the special yeah. thing: what I love about this this channel, you know, usually we could talk about books and be talk good. Here's pros and cons. It is very rare for me to find a book where I can just gush about it, and I can just say good things and be like, read this book. And I can say it without stuttering. I can say it unabashedly. I'm just happy that I can say that about a book. Mm. It take it's a long time since that's happened. You get what I mean? Like when you're covering your Wheel of Time stuff yeah. and you're on a book, you just love it and you can only say good things. It's just great. It's a great feeling It is when wonderful. you find something like that. And I found my thing. You're going to find your thing. Read this book. Richard, what is your spoiler-free rating on this book out of 10? Spoiler-free rating is a 6.55 out of 10. It's a good book. It's above average. So my rating for the book is a 9.7 out of 10. It is the second highest rating I have ever given 
on two to ramble. The first being very slightly, I gave the 9.75 to Oathbringer. Honestly, there's an argument that ugh, I, I, I just got I do just want to point gonna, out yeah. that this elitist comment coming is not directed at you guys watching. Oh, no. Not at all. It's solely focused and targeted toward Austin here. Yep. There's a reason why the bookshelf behind us is my bookshelf and not your bookshelf. 9.7 is insane. <laughs> that Rich, is an insane score. Rich, I just got to say this. I know that the series probably gets better. I've been By the next book, it gets a yeah, lot better. Here's 9.7 the- 9. means there's no growth. There's nothing beyond. Like, there's a 0.3, like a, a rounding error that it's slightly... No, no, no. Golden Sun, the second book, is at least twice as good. It is so magnitudes it's a, better. It's an 18.4. <laughs> yes. That's what you're Your rating scale doesn't make a but lick of sense. Here's the thing. It's twice as good to you, but I already love this so much. I love this nearly as much as I loved when I read Oathbringer, which is my favorite book ever. I have those feelings. Now, here's the thing. Before, I will let you know. Yeah. I went through the exact same thing over a year ago. With when this book? My, well, no. When I started reading fantasy and uh, sci-fi again. Yeah. And I started with the Stormlight Archive, and I remember rating um, Words of Radiance yeah. like a 9.8 out of 10. Like, it, it was close to the like, perfect book for me, and I was like, this is my favorite thing ever I've, I've ever read. And then as I started reading more books, I kept having to knock it down because I was like, oh, shoot. Is this the best? Like, this element, is the action better in this other book? Well, yes, kind of. And so as I read more, my original scores got knocked down some. I think by the next Red Rising video, when we read Golden Sun, we're going to do a review on that one. You're going to lower your score for Red Rising. You think so? Okay. I think you're going to, like, by necessity, have to. You're going to have to make a revision and go, hey, look, Golden Sun is my 9.7. And you're going to be like, okay, look, Red Rising, I'm going to have to knock you down a little bit to a 9.1. I think that's where you're going to go. I'll, I will keep I'm, this. I'm making that claim. I'm going to see if we're right. We'll see if you're right, but I want to say this. I, if you don't want to listen to me either, I am not alone in this at, at all. Another mm-hmm. booktuber, Patrick Leo, this is his favorite sci-fi series, and he has read a lot more books than me. And first off, I do want to say- No, my, series? No, no, I understand no, not just, way not, more Not just than series, book. but even the first book, he gives 4.5 out of 5 stars, and this is, oh, okay. this is what he has to say in the book. Mm. So he, Patrick Leo says this. He says- the book felt naturally fast-paced and utterly readable, and the words he chose were raw, full of rage, brutal, and also poignant at times. Almost every scene, whether it was superb action, strategic planning, or even when the characters were just talking to each other, pumped my blood with an adrenaline rush. Patrick, I could not agree more, and I knew you would come and bully me and say you read more books, so I'm I... pulling out BookTube support. My <laughs> BookTube community, know. come out here, trash Richard for trying to shame me for reading less than him, you snob. I just want to say, <laughs> our patrons actually agree with me about this book. Well, the If people... you want to join us in a book club, which this was actually one of our yeah. book clubs of the month, you can join us in Patreon in the link down below. They actually agree with me, and they were trashing you. It was a lot of fun. The people that support us suck! <laughs> <laughs> actually, the, it was a really fun conversation. So yeah. we, we talked about this. We have our monthly book club. This was the book club of the month. And I will also say this. As far as my 9.7, we're still on spoiler free. As mm-hmm. far as my 9.7 rating goes can you at least say right now it is valid like this is how i feel about it the is book. valid to you right now because i it understand i'm just telling you of my own <laughs> experience of what happened to me on sure. my favorite thing and then i was like oh shoot i'm just i f- i see your experience and i'm yeah. going like i went through the same thing here that's here's what, all i'm saying is i get i you. went through similar thing i get you but i've had enough of the bullying <laughs> <laughs> no i i gotta say this with my nine seven okay yeah just spoiler free still if you haven't been convinced already to read this book, I started reading this book and I was sitting at home and then my friend, my roommate said, not you, my other better roommate, he said, hey, do you want to go to Panera's to eat? And I said, sure. And you know what I did walking to Panera's? Had this book glued to my hand, walking, oncoming traffic and everything. Walked straight to Panera's, could not put the book down. Sat the book down at Panera's, reading the book. My friend wants to go. Hey, we got to go home. It's getting dark out. I said, get the hell out of here. I just hit chapter 28 and the most amazing thing happened. He leaves. I keep reading at Panera's. I walk back home alone, still reading the book on my hand. I get home, lie in my bed. I finish the book that night till 2 a.m. 
I could not physically put this book down. That justifies the 9-7 alone for me. I have so much praise to say, and there's so much we have to get into in the spoilers. Right before we get into spoilers, oh, I yeah. do want to actually give a thank you to our sponsor of the video, Displate, and we'll go right back to our spoiler uh, talk right after this ad. A quick pause to talk about our sponsor, Displate. They have some great products. Their metal posters are actually made in Europe. Super unique, easy, magnetic mounting system where you can just... One of the cool things, you can actually swap those out. Same mounting brackets, and you just put out your other metal poster. Does not damage the wall whatsoever. This is a company we have known about and liked their things before they reached out to us. They have art of different brands and all of your Marvel, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and... Did I mention Lord of the Rings up there? You could see here all the designs that Displate sent us. A Lord of the Rings poster. A Dune poster. This weird pine cone looking thing. That one's mine, by the way. Also a great image of the World Tree Serpent. And lastly, of course, Gandalf. And deliveries typically come within uh, four to five business days, so really quick. And hey, save a little bit for the environment because they're on metal and not actual paper and posters. Every poster they that you actually buy, they plant one tree. We have our own page where we handpicked, selected what we think you guys would like on displate.com slash two to ramble, just like our channel. Displate's giving our viewers 20% off if you get one to two displates and 30% off if you get three or more displates if you use the code two to ramble. Not only do you get cool stuff, it supports us. They'll keep working with us in the future. This is crazy. We, we have a us. sponsor. All right. All right. Into spoiler spoilers. warning. Spoiler warning, you've been warned. You've been mighty warned. Please read this book. Do not listen if you have not read, read this book yet. It is time. All right. First category? First category. Emotional impact. What'd you get them out of 10? I gave it a 6.25 out of 10. I I mean, obviously, you're not going to know most of my ratings here. <laughs> 9.8 out of 10. <laughs> and I guess my emotional impact, what I just said before we broke there, is how much it, this book glued me. I could not stop reading it. Clearly, I am emotionally invested. So that's the first thing. Incredibly, it could not put the book down physically. Secondly, mm -hmm. I would say the inciting incident and everything that was packed in a relatively short book was mind-blowing. I love the writing, the world building. There are so many moments to talk about. And let's keep it more vague on the emotional side. We'll get into characters. We'll get yeah. into plot. But just general emotion of the book. How would you feel finishing this? Generally, I enjoyed part one, I think, the most out of the book. I thought the premise, the world building, all that really hooked me in. I remember really loving that part. Uh, when it got to the Hunger Games section, there's certain relationships that just didn't quite work for me and a lot of so some character decisions kind of confused me with darrow and i didn't buy some of his motivation we'll and talk about that in so characters that, yeah, yeah we'll talk about that later but mainly what brought me out of it was a certain character relationship between darrow and mustang and then also some a plot device that just doesn't it bothers me it, it's actually the this book is the what got me aware of one of my least favorite tropes in writing, I don't even know if there's even a fix to it. It just annoys me. So I think this book did fix it. This book, I we'll talk disagree, about it in plot. But yeah. We'll talk about it in plot, but this... So anything else with emotion? Is there... Would you say it's good? I mean, I said recommend the book. You'd recommend this book too. Yeah, I definitely... Here's the thing. If, if you're not bothered with the Mustang and Darrow relationship like I am, then... I can see someone rating this so much higher than me. Like a 9.7. Not even that far, but still. It you, is... you looked really angry when you said that. <laughs> I don't think you were joking there. You looked at me like this dude. Like, I can't believe I have a podcast with this lunatic. It's, it's an insane score. But whatever. It, hey, look, that's your opinion. It's fine. You're allowed to be wrong. I'm just call. You know... Okay. I'm calling my shot on yeah. what's happening next, Red Rising. Can, can I'm you just least, saying. Have you seen me this excited with a book ever? Since when? Stormlight. Since Oathbringer, which I give a 9.75. Yeah. I guess like, so. How do I not justify this excitement otherwise by the scale? It's not like I'm sitting here going, it's a great, it's, you know, it's a great book, 9.7. I, I mean, I can't speak. Uh, this is better than some of my top 10 movies I've ever watched. Like, if I'm comparing I it to guess. movies, I look at this. This is up there with Mad Max, one of my favorite movies ever. So, anyways, I do love it. Yeah. I know you like it. I like it. I'm gonna, Man, I'm going to sound like such a negative Nancy this entire... It, it's I fine. have to. It's good. Because... Ev okay, look. 
if I talk about the positives, I'm just repeating what you say. I have to pull out the negatives. That's that's my role today. That's what I'm doing. Can can you at least feed some of the positives too? Like emotionally, sure. You loved part one. I I liked part one quite a bit. Good. Um, Daryl as a character is interesting and fun to follow. Uh, at least through most of it for me, the <laughs> action is fun. The writing itself doesn't really. I think it's a little corny at times. And it does take me out of it. So some of the speeches... Now, you want to talk about, like, YA elements of it. It's the grandiose speeches. Very corny. And, like, YA level, he improves dramatically in the second book. Much better. But that's my emotional impact. Understood. And when we get into dialogue prose, I'll specifically say why I could not disagree more. (laughs) Emotionally, I get you. I could see how you like this book, and I could see how you see the future books are better than this. I understand your point of view. I'm not going to invalidate you, man. I see. That's the difference. I am. (laughs) (laughs) I'm calling my shot. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay, you want to get right into the characters? Let's talk to talk. So characters, what'd you give it out of 10? A 6.25. No, sorry. 6.5. 6.5. Okay, I gave characters a (laughs) 9.8. Yeah, for me, the side characters were fine. Do but, you want to move, let's move side characters next. Let's first start with Darrow. Sure. For example, what do you think about Darrow? Part one, Darrow, I thought was incredibly fascinating. And the the main part about it is that it was focused on so much is how he his love for his wife is greater than his desire for freedom for his people. And that when he's talking with Eo, it's like, I live for you, and she tells him well, you need to live for more. And he, that she decides to actually basically kill herself to force um, to force Darrow to go on this crusade. And during that, it's the internal conversations in his head where he goes, one, Ea was right about the golds and the reds, but beyond that, she valued this over our love. It's It's got to be worth something. I'm going to do this for her. So very interesting take where it's he's a little disconnected from the cause itself. And he's mostly doing it for his dead wife, especially in the beginning. That's his main motivation. I would say that's fairly true up to I think it's about chapter 10. So with Daryl, first, let's talk about his arc. Mm -hmm. His arc as a character, he is rash and rageful. And he learns throughout the book to become a leader and to and to contain his anger. So with these That's actually something we're gonna get onto. I think it is set up and talked about how he has talked about his rage. I don't think it's actually well explored or even negative his rage never really negatively impacts him throughout the entire book. And it's talked about how he needs to contain his rage. And it, it'll negatively affect him. I don't think it negatively affects him throughout the entire book. He's really well contained the entire time. The only times he's rageful, it, it's not a negative. It doesn't hurt him. That's a big part for me that, like, it does take me out of his character. Is for this book specifically, and I'm narrowing it to this oh, book. Oh, yeah, please don't give me spoilers. I'm not giving else. you anything, but... His rage is not a negative factor for him. It's talked about. It's said that he needs to keep that he needs to keep it under control. But he doesn't. It never shows itself as an actual problem, even though it's said it is. I, I disagree completely. Because with Darrow, so he's impetuous and rash and has this rage inside him. And I have a list here of like from throughout the book. So where the first book starts, the very opening scene is how Uncle Nero and all of them don't want to mind this thing and his mm-hmm. rashness, and he just goes for it. So that's kind of his nature. He goes for it. He doesn't care. He's going to do this for the long term. But anyways, that's that's the first introduction to Darrow as a character. Now, I have here in chapter four where the, this quote says, after they lose the laurel, when they supp- were supposed to win, he says, Eo doesn't let me boil in it. She doesn't let my knuckles turn white as I clench my fists in fury. She knows the temper I have inside me better than even my own mother, and she knows how to drain rage before it rises. So Eo's there quelling his rage throughout that introduction to the book. And then when Eo dies, his reaction to that is he wants to kill himself. He's over. 
he has nothing to live for anymore. And this goes into your other point. It's also not rage. With, that is more depression. Oh, he's yeah, sad. he's it's yeah. not. No, no, no. That's rage. that's not the rage portion. So he's mm-hmm. there's nothing. He feels completely depressed. Wants to die. And so where your point is, where you know he's doing it all for EO, he is. But here's here's where the story changes. When he sees the city, I think it's like chapter ten or somewhere mm-hmm. around there, where he was shown that EO was also right. She was right. So she she was right that they were lying to them and they need they need to do something. And this is what it says in the book. Darrow says, EO was right. It comes to violence. She was the voice like my father. So what am I to be? The avenging hand? I cannot grasp that someone so pure, so full of love would want me to play this part. But she did. I think of my father's last dance. I think of my mom, Liana, Kieran, Lauren, Eo's parents, Uncle Nero, Barlow, everyone I love. I know how hard they will live and how quickly they will die, and now I know why. This is after him seeing the city. I look down at my own hands. They are what Dancer called them, cut, scarred, burned things. When Eo kissed them, they grew gentle for love. Now that she is gone, they grow hard for hate. I clench them into fists till my knuckles are white as ice caps. What is my mission? So now this transitions to where EO was right. So he's doing it for EO, but on top of that, they were lied to. I need to do this for everybody I love. We need this freedom. He now sees the truth. So where, yes, EO is a driving motivation to this, but then even further in the book, he has a conversation with Dancer, this exact conflict you're talking about, where Darrow says he's a weapon to be used when he's being transformed into this gold. He's a weapon, and he's keeping EO's dream alive. He says, uh, it's keeper. Again, it's, it's yeah. not... His dream, it's Eo's dream. Oh, yeah, dream. certainly. He is, he is angry for her death and the fact that she died for this. And there's also those little, those mo- those internal moments where he's going, she valued this more than she loved me. And that, that hurts him deeply. And so because of that, he wants to do this for her. Yeah, it's an extension of that. So he loves Eo deeply. Yeah. That's, of I, course. In priority, like in the hierarchy of priorities. Yes. Yeah. Is he doing this, like, he agrees with the revolution, sure, yes, he knows it's right, but is he doing it mostly for that, or mostly for EO? I'd say it's mostly for EO. This is what Dancer says, she says, so don't go around spitting anger and hate, you're not fighting against them no matter what Harmony says, you're fighting for EO's dream, for your family that is still alive, your people, says Dancer. Um, and then says something about Darrow's a good person who wants to do bad things. And he says, that's what I don't get. If I'm a good man, then why do I want to do bad things? Feeling this kind of rage. So it's definitely EO is a part of it, but it's his people. It's EO's dream. Yes, certainly. And as far as his rage goes throughout the book, why it's so well done, why his rage is so well disguised is his rage and his anger comes off as pride. And that's why he's able to befriend some of the, like Cassius, for example. His first meeting with Cassius, literally he says, Cassius is all that he despises. He hates these golds. He says, because of the way he looks, I feel the need to provoke Cassius, just because he looks that way. So Darrow acts sarcastic, abrasive, uh, says the test was too easy for him. You know, is cocky about it. But him being cocky and him trying to get on the guy's nerves, Cassius admires that because that's what the golds are. They're a prideful bunch. And this continues when, you know, he gets his test results back and Darrow says, uh, no, the, the guys come to check the tests. And they go, oh, did you cheat? They're, you know, the RE8s, I forget how you say their name, but they're checking if he cheated since he scored so highly. And his response is, I think my results speak for themselves. I took a gory piss on your test, sir. Right? You're just being, he doesn't like these goals. They're, he does not like them whatsoever. And then even in the scene where he's training, not training, sorry, he's at the institute getting tested. Fitchner punches him. You know, they're, they're seeing if they want these people on their team. Fitchner punches him, say, hey, if you punch back, you'll be sent home. So, Daryl, what's he do? Kicks him in the shin. You son of a bitch. Kicks him in the shin instead. That's where his, his rashness, his anger comes out of, you know, screw this guy. Kicks him in the shin, but that's good to the golds. It's seen as something that's good, as prideful. And then, yeah. yeah. It, but do you get where I'm talking about of With his what? rage being, oh, I need to control my rage? It, it doesn't negatively affect him. Every, his rage is actually beneficial and positive. This whole, like, it's never a negative effect on the story. Then here's where this changes. So Cassius, again, is like, oh, you studied? Darrow, Darrow asks him, oh, sorry, Darrow asks Cassius, oh, you studied for this? To kind of embarrass him in front of everybody. And so he keeps this antagonistic perspective on all of them. The end of part three is where the shifts. This is where the story shifts. It's where Julian and him are faced in a cage. Mm-hmm. And he must face him. And so what Darrow's internal dialogue says, he goes, 
My people need this. Io sacrificed happiness and her life. Rage overtakes me. My face go numb. My face goes numb. My heart thunders. It's in my throat. My veins prickle. And basically he breaks Julian, cracks him. He's twitching on the floor. And then the very next chapter, what Darrow says, I thought the society only played games with its slaves. Wrong. Julian didn't score like I did on the tests. He wasn't as physically capable as I. So he was a sacrificial lamb. Even the family Bologna, which Julian was a part of, powerful as they are, could not protect their less capable son. So immediately when that happens, you know, he's rageful, he's bitter against all these goals that have been, even the kids that have been in that play field. Immediately when that happens, he goes, wait a second, some of these goals are also in this game. They're not up in the hierarchy. Someone like Julian can also die. And now he almost, he feels guilty and like he owes Cassius something, which is why they're able to become friends in the story more easily. And he also connects with the golds like Severo in the story because they're on the low totem pole just like Reds are in the real world. So this rageful part of him is quelled toward the golds that he can be friends with throughout the story. So that's why you see that, where his rage and anger anger comes out is against like the proctors, where it comes out is against the Mm -hmm. people he feels are actually doing wrong. That's where the rage goes. He still feels this way. Again, all of these examples is, it still doesn't seem like, there's no instance where his rage actually negatively affects him. That the instance of Julian, like he had to do it. There's no... There's no if, ands, or buts. Like, he had to do that. All these instances where he channels his rage in a more productive way. And, yeah, he is he is the best guy for the job because he's able to channel his rage toward the system and not specifically the golds. That the, there are golds that are actually oppressed in the system, which is very interesting. I... I I like that. Okay, here's an example but of I the, would, here's an example when yeah. the rage did affect him. When he's going to talk to Titus because mm-hmm. there's conflict in the area of like they got to talk to Titus so that they can become one group. He's he goes over there and he's you know they're kind of picking on him and Vixus and Titus are all there and he says this to Vixus, 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 Vixus. There are no boys like me. And he slams his hand at Vixus's jugular like a sledgehammer strike and runs out of there. And causing negotiations are over. It's a it's a battle between the factions. Like yeah, that, he ruined the negotiating there. I guess it, it's kind of small uh, an exam. It's kind of a small example, but I guess you're right. That that it is a small example, but ultimately I don't see it, it is a lot of talked about, and you get a lot of these internal moments of yeah, his rage is coming out and all this. I just never see it as something he actually has to get over. It's never much of a negative because you're right. It works so well with the golds. He's able to channel it perfectly where it makes him more like a gold. So that's a character decision that I remember reading and going through and going, what do you mean he has to get over his rage? (laughs) It's working out great so far. Like for the most part, like he's doing fine. He's much better with Titus is the example to like how his rage is uncontrolled and unfocused and it basically makes him a bad a bad infiltrator that's a good example of showing like when it gets in the way and darrow is not that definitely not Dar- yeah what darrow does why titus is such a great character is titus represents what he could turn into he represents like hey i can't do that because if i ever own a fleet what will i do when i have power and titus represents what you shouldn't be doing as a red and committing these violent crimes. And that's what I loved in the story too with these two characters, Titus and Tactus, and how you have a red that commits these atrocities and sexual assault. And then you also have Tactus who does the same. Mm -hmm. So you have both red and gold are committing the same heinous crime and it puts things in perspective for the message of the story and for Darrow as a character. So uh, did you like that at all? Did you like those characters? I like that. The main, what I would have liked more and to give it a good example is Rage of Dragons has also a similar thing of mm. character on a revenge door and like he is full of rage, what that and has to get over his rage. That 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 is the same kind of character arc. The difference with Rage of Dragons is there are actual moments in the plot where the character makes the objectively wrong decision and actively hurts themselves and their goals because of their rage. Their rage is an active impediment to their goals and of the story. 
It, it's something, it's a genuine problem he needs to get over. With Darrow, that example of showing that, hey, his rage could be a problem. But that's only could. I, I never bought for a second that Darrow's rage was a problem. I always saw it as like, this is kind of his strength. And that I never mm. saw him going the Tactus route. Because he did really quickly identify with the golds. And like the golds that were trod upon. He was angry at the system, which is exactly what he needs to do. And so I never really bought that he would ever become a Tactus. Where oh. what would what would get me and being like Tactus would be a really good lesson for him is if there's a moment there or where his rage actively hurts his mission. And it like he has a a moment of weakness and he lets his rage consume him and it actively hurts his goal. And then that's a that's a moment pause of like, oh yeah, he could become Tactus. He really could, where he does something despicable. That would have been... Then what, he would have needed the lesson. I don't think example. he needed the lesson. What do you think he needed to do to get you to like him as a character? That specific element of his character, I would have liked to see him probably do something to have a lesser degree of what Tactus does. Uh, a Titus, I mean. Be because where he yeah. tortures or does something objectively wrong and turns people against him. And like loses a lot of position where he turns people against it because of his rage and his vindictiveness against golds as a people. Mm. And that gets in the way of his goal. I don't think we ever really see that. We see kind of minor examples and we get the internal dialogue in his head of says he's rageful, but he always channels it in a good direction. Now, I want to say this. You're doing a good job. We're not being too rageful toward each other yet. Oh, yeah. You know, for giving a 9-5 and a 6-something. <laughs> You're channeling it in a good direction. I see that. See? So we are representing what Darrow's doing, right? So yeah, no. That, I, here's what I want to yeah. say, though. With the with the rage and impulsive, impulsiveness that he has, a lot of that comes out before the game. Because he kills Julian, and it changes things. It changes his perspective of where to target that rage. So I guess the character arc you were looking for already happened in 1-3. to three. You were you wanted that the whole book, so it did happen where he he was angry at these people and did things that actively you know when him kicking Fitchner or even where he did ruin things by whacking Vixus and breaking negotiations. It is a time where that is shown. So then beyond yeah, yeah beyond I, I that just happening, didn't see that here's enough. here's the thing: when Titus died and got rid of mm -hmm. the bad guy, what this story is also about with Darrow, it's showing how to be a leader. So that that part of the story is much better handled. So. He, Gotcha. Be, and mainly because he does fail. His leadership tactic fails completely I, I would, <laughs> and completely collapses, and he learns from that to actually become a better leader. What do you think he failed at as a leader? Well, I know we discussed before, and I think you're completely right. It's the difference between vengeance and justice, where yeah. he thought that, oh, I have to allow people to have vengeance. And ven basically, the there's a kind of common historical tactic of like these generals with their armies like i'm thinking like hannibal um where there's reports of like oh yeah you have to let your soldiers you know rape and pillage you have to let them have this vengeful and you have to let them get it out for them to like you you can't hold them back in that or else you're gonna have a mutiny on your hands and so that's kind of what um darrow is kind of thinking hey i need to allow the i need to allow my people to have their vengeance i need to lead like a vengeful army and he realizes no, <laughs> you're going to lose control. And that's, I think that vengeance comes from his rage is another point of where this is being shown is he lets Titus die by Cassius's hand. Like that, that whole thing is that was vengeance, not justice. And mm -hmm. he leads, when he leads them after Titus dies, I believe this was in later in the book, this is even mentioned where he was leading improperly because he was, he was leading almost by an iron fist. Yeah. Where he was leading by power power alone he wasn't a good leader and that comes from his inner feelings that comes that's why he was a bad leader stems from his character and how impulsive rash and rageful he is well he now, demand, demanded yeah. respect rather than earning it mm -hmm. and that that was the main difference is he at first he thought power and demanding respect would be enough to be a leader he later realized after being betrayed and that he has to earn it he has to show examples right. of why they would want to follow him Voluntarily, I think that intertwines with his rashness and rage so well. Maybe you don't think as much, but why I gave it, why I love the character so much as well, is that that rage, like like we already discussed, is the part one to three arc, 
mm-hmm. where he it changes the second he has to kill Julian, it changes his perspective of these kids in the arena. So he doesn't go in there like Titus thinking all of the golds are the same. Yeah. Otherwise, our main protagonist is a villain at that point. If you want him to go in there, his rage causes him to rape people. No, that that's Titus's perspective. Yeah. So the, no, I I want Ti- him to have not not be a villain, but actually be more of an impediment. Where I get you. And so you I, I don't think to, those things tie together. Right, but I think for what Pierce Brown's trying to write here, he wasn't trying to write that story. That's so Rage yeah. of Dragons is a different story. But the, do you want do you understand of like when it's talked about, especially internal dialogue? Oh, his rage is being a problem, yeah. and then. Just in the story as examples, I just don't really see his rage actually being a problem. It's Titus's rage is a problem. His rage is not really a problem. He has it under control. He's kind, you're, maybe you're right on Julian where he's kind of solved it, where he has more sympathy for the golds. And yet going forward, it's still talked about his rage being a problem. I don't see it being a problem. And so that's the problem where it's you set up that he needs to overcome his rage. Mm. And then I'm, I'm sitting there going, Eh, no, he doesn't really. He kind of already has this figured out. Like, he's justifiably angry plenty of times. He channels his rage in a good direction. He's not Titus. And I don't think it ever will be become Titus. That's where I'm... I, that, that's, I think, the disconnect. I see I see your point. And that point with Vixus, on top of that, there's a later point with Mustang. Remember when the two people try to rape Mustang as well? So yeah. So, rape's using this a lot where she has to tell him not to kill the guy. So like you're saying, the rage is always pointed in the right direction, mm-hmm. right? So you, you think his rage is always pointed at the right bad guys, and you wanted his rage pointed at a good guy. Am I misinterpreting or that? Mainly, or where where some, do you want his rage to go? Basically in a direction that would kind of harm... It, it would stand in the way of his goals, where it's a genuine, like, after moment of going, oh, I just made my job harder. Oh, I made I made my situation worse because of my rage. I let my rage get to me. I I've just never seen like his rage at Mustang almost being raped is like, yeah, that's <laughs> I'm not gonna fall. I'm never gonna. Yeah, it's just it doesn't seem like a problem to me. Okay, I'd say the two points then with the Titus versus Tactus mm-hmm. point, and also with Vixus and him ruining that. That is a moment. Maybe it wasn't as big of a moment for you. Yeah. It was earlier on in the book when they were trying to coalesce the group to go and march on the other armies as well. Yeah, it. I think his the thing he does have to get over more, it, it's mm. mostly a strength through most of, the, most of the book, and then becomes a kind of weakness he does get over, is his rashness. That is different, where he's kind of going with this, he's just generally rash, but it kind of works for him all the time, like, mm. it's what makes him better. Right. <laughs> he, He's a better hell diver because of it. He's a better gold because of his rashness. That's always been his benefit. And then when he's in the games, he re- he's going with that same strategy. And he goes, hey, power. And he's logically thinking like, hey, look, I'm just going to body these other guys and they'll respect me. And so he ruins the negotiations in part because like, hey, they'll respect me if I'm more powerful. And Wait, I'm- with which one? With um, Vixus. Vixus. Like, more that of, wasn't that. No. His rashness is more of a strategy, isn't it? No, that was... They were cornering him. He's just like, um, yeah, f- screw you. And smashes his throat and runs. <laughs> yeah. That, was just, that, that wasn't like a... So I guess it could intertwine with the rashness. So the main thing is, he's rash and he thinks power's enough. Yeah. And then he learns, no, <laughs> gotcha. that's not. And so that's a much better... Sure. I, I guess when I'm looking at a figure like Darrow, I look at him and it's not the same character, but in a movie like Gladiator with Russell Crowe. Mm-hmm. He's the guy where you don't need... It's a different kind of character that you were looking for, I guess. Because I didn't go in there with... A, I didn't expect this to be the gray character of all gray characters, where he made a decision like that, where I was for a moment... Because I'm always rooting for Darrow. And his anger yeah. is justified and in the right place. It makes it so easy to get behind him. And you mm-hmm. want to see his growth as a leader. You want to see him be less rash. You want to see his anger contained into he's not killing innocent people, which you're not fearful of that point. But what you are is if he gets this power and gets a fleet, he's just going to kill golds. Like, what's he going to do when he gets power? So you want to see him in the right position by the time he gets there, if he gets there. That's what you're rooting for. So, you know, when I'm watching Gladiator and Russell Crowe, I'm just watching him kick ass a lot of the times. I'm watching him... Well, uh, in specifically yeah. Gladiator, it is not established that, oh, he needs to control his rage. He needs to control his anger. That's not a problem set up. He's completely justified. And th- there's never a point in that story where it's like, yeah, that's never established as an issue because like he's completely right and he's going forward and you're all on board. 
in this book specifically, it is established and talked about frequently from other characters and Darrow himself that his rage is a problem. Well, here's, and I just don't see it. As well, that here's way. where it gets stopped. And you know how EO calmed him at first in the beginning, mm-hmm. not to lash out because of the Laurel getting stolen. It's just like after with Mustang, even though she was about to get assaulted, she had to stop him from murdering the guys. Now, even if the rage is justified, her stopping him from doing that and him not acting out of that ragefulness is a good thing long term for him because he needs to learn how to control that. He needs those people around him. He needs to learn that lesson where okay, I am furious. I want to cut their heads off. I mean, he says this multiple times with when he's talking to Fitchner and, and talk about the jackal who he hadn't met yet. He just goes, I want to rip his balls off. He just says, I want to rip his balls off. And when Tactus does these horrible things as well, and again, these are against the antagonist, he, oh, when Tactus does the horrible thing and uh, to Nyla, mm-hmm. um, when he shows that he's a good leader by getting whippings himself before he goes to taxes, be like, you deserve to have your balls off, you selfish bastard. And he knows he can't do anything about it. He's containing that. So yeah. you are seeing him contain his rage. Now, the point where you're right on didn't bother it, me as it's much. It's mostly is, words rather than actions. Right, it's that's not. All. So it's Mustang holding him back. It's him holding back. So he is held back and you don't want him to do that. You're like, no, 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 no. You just wanted a scene more vivid than the the Vixus part early on. It's, where he, it's the it difference between saying it and showing it. There's plenty of scenes and talk where it says the rage is problem, where the internal dialogue, like, yeah, in his head, he's very rageful. I never, I don't really see that in example as much. I would say must, That's, but I do yeah. want to say we've been going on this point a while. Have we? It's been yeah, it's been a minute. I'd okay. say we should, if we're going into characters, okay. I do want to mention I also did not like particularly the relationship between Mustang and Darrow. Okay, go and, ahead. And a lot of it it comes down to, hit, I think that EO is his main motivation, his primary motivation for all of his actions. In his darkest moments, it's EO that brings him out of it. When he's going, being carved up, when he's going through, it's EO that kind of calms him and he's realizing, like, I'm doing this for her. Mm. Him falling in love with Mustang doesn't work for me, especially in this book specifically. I don't, I just don't buy it as much. And okay. even if it does, like, even if that goes forward, the fact that that doesn't really seem to affect his motivation for um, taking down the system, I would think it, I would. St- think that it would it, or it would change his motivation or at least maybe temper his rage i would think something i didn't really buy that relationship as much and overall his kind of fair ease and being able to make friends with golds seems weird okay but so to those th- th- those things just didn't work as much so to the second point the fair ease i'd say goes back to where he was he was bothersome to Cassius. He mm-hmm. what he was act, the guy was arrogant and he hated him the moment he laid his eyes on him. But what changed to befriend Cassius was the plot scene where he killed a dude's brother and he realizes these golds are also dying off that are weaker. And now he felt like he owed Cassius something. And he also wasn't revealing that he killed his brother to Cassius. And also the reason he allies with all the low dress and several is because he relates to them more. So he doesn't mm-hmm. ally with the other golds, at least especially at first, where it's like the Titus is the uh, what's her name, um, Augustine, Augustina or Antonia, Antonia. <laughs> so that's, you're gonna have to help me with yeah, names. That's that, been, it's been a while since I read the book. <laughs> but that's that's why he's able to befriend them, and with the relationship, why it didn't bother me as much. And if you could tell, I gave this a nine seven, so I love everything pretty much about the book. I'm gonna give one complaint in the plot section. If people are still here, we've been so on point with this, where we really went into Darrow and. I want to talk about it still, but we can't. It's, it's yeah, too much no, time. It, we're, we, we're starting to lose. It's an interesting difference, and I, I like that. Hopefully, they got something out of that. So with Mustang and EO, why I could I see how it could bother you, that EO's his motivation, but looking at their relationship, it, it was very important that, that Pierce Brown mentioned this as well, that they were in the arena over a year, longer than EO and him were actually married. Now, all that doesn't mean he doesn't love EO anymore. He constantly well, also, says that... he knew EO longer than before, before he yeah, was yeah. married. So with, with that relationship, so obviously it starts when they're healing each other. And mm-hmm. she saves his life. He saves... Well, he at first let Mustang go and saved her life, so she in return saves his, his life. And throughout that relationship, they, they heal each other, they grow, they bond, and she sings EO's song. And he even says every time he looks at her, um, every time he looks at her, he thinks of EO. And 
at, uh, there's a scene as well where Mustang is nudging up to him and he goes, you know, she's a distraction and it goes away. Mustang even says, what happened? You used to, you know, we used to sleep closer to each other. What happened? And he goes, no, uh, yeah, I'm not going back to that, whatever. So constantly is denying Mustang staying focused. He owes the love of his life. And so it was slowly done in a methodical way where I, I didn't find it to negatively impact the relationship because this guy's 16, 17 years old. He owes the love of his life. And when they do fall in love, the moment's so impactful because he doesn't realize he really, really loves her until she's taken away and feels what he's been missing out on and has to go save her in Mount Olympus, right? Mount, mm-hmm. So he has to save her in Mount Olympus. And after the battle, this is what he, he basically says, she smiles. Or I think this is after that battle. He says, she smiles at me. She is beautiful, like EO. Every time he's even describing her, mm-hmm. every single moment he's describing Mustang, EO's still in his head. So it's not like he's forgetting EO. And then when they do, when he does kiss her, he says, this is when I kiss her. I cannot give her the Hamanthus. This is my heart and it is of Mars. One of the only things born from the red soil and it is still EO's. But this girl, when I, when, when they, when I look at her, I would have done anything to get, to see her smirking again. Perhaps one day I'll have two hearts to give. So he kisses her and it's, He's rash. He's impulsive. He even notes this after kissing her like, I, I just did. I just did. My heart is still Eos. He's conflicted. It's not like suddenly he just fell in love with Mustang. I thought it was really methodically done and added another conflict going into part to book two. That just fascinates me. That's why I love the relationship so much. But I've been talking your ear off. What do you have to say? You make a good point. I still don't buy it. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. But you can see why I love this book, man. I really I, I love you. this book. I Now, I want to actually sing some praises. Oh, okay. hallelujah! <laughs> yes, hold on. Let me turn happy face. Oh, wait, happy face was it's all, on. Happy face is already out. I can't believe you didn't turn angry face at all. I'm not angry. I just okay, know you're Okay, sad wrong. face. Sad okay, face. Fine. <laughs> well, oh, what are we going to call him? Or her? Eh, someone will let us know. So what one to call person, Orcish Dad, one of our patrons, said, he, "It should name it Austin." Yeah, name it Austin, which I think would just be a little trippy. Yeah, <laughs> turning Austin inside out. Yeah, that's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> let's name him. Ooh, let's name him Red, so we can remember this moment. Red, ah, fine. You like Red? That? Red's yes. a good name. Okay, All so right. sing some praises about the characters. Because there's so I many think characters. To talk my about. absolute favorite moment from the entire book. Ooh. is the moment where Darrow has um, the jackal at the table. Oh. And that whole, like, yeah, I'll let you leave if you oh. cut off your hand. And easily just goes, yep, okay, and starts sawing. And it wasn't that much. Like, one, yeah, great villain. Like, I'm already set up like, oh, he's intimidating. Mm-hmm. It's the moment where Darrow actually talks about, like, he had an animalistic like reaction of like oh i can't let him i can't let him leave no 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 this is not someone you piss on and let go i need to kill him now because oh boy this is not good (laughs) like that's the the fear of oh i need to kill him now this is this is not a threat you let go that was a great moment for a villain Loved it. Same team, buddy. Let's go. Same team. That, I, that was my favorite moment love of the it. book. Love that. And I think all the antagonists in this book are chef's kiss. Where you have Jackal. You also have Titus as an antagonist. It, w- we also have the yep. Jackal's like right hand, which was fine. Yeah. Looked it, but sure. Yeah. Sure, but with, with all the antagonists, Titus being an antagonist, I thought was... Titus and... Oh my goodness, why can't I say it? Antonia were great in the beginning. You have the, the representation of that paragon of strong and strength. And the conniving one made a really interesting conflict to start mm. off with Mars. And then you go off to more of the... And Mustang's an antagonist at one point. Tamara as an antagonist. Apollo as an antagonist. But then the overarching antagonist, the Proctors. But even beyond that, Augustus. I believe Augustus being the uh, the, emperor, the imperator, the, the big bad. My goodness, what a bad guy. All the antagonists here are super memorable, and there's a lot of them. It actually get into world building aspect, but we'll get into there. Augustus's speech, I think, does the most to make the world building of the whole structure of the society incredibly interesting. And 
it's a tease. It, it's such a good tease that is later fleshed out in later books that I will I give world building much higher in those scores, but it definitely is my highest rated here. Awesome. Now, to get you guys that are watching even more invested, if you didn't like Augustus as much, this is about to change your mind. You want to hear what the Kyle Derrick himself... I'm ready. This So Kyle, what he did for us is he read off Augustus's speech right before they're all going into, into the Hunger Institute, Games. into the Hunger Games. This is Augustus's speech, and it's perfect. All right, Kyle, take it away. Society is three stages. Savagery, ascendance, decadence. decadence. The great rise because of savagery. They rule in ascendance. They fall because of their decadence. Men are not created equal. We all know this. There are averages. There are outliers. There are the ugly. That's you. There are the beautiful. That's me. No, you Kyle. are the Let's best be of humanity, but you have been coddled. You have been treated like children. Were you born to a different color? You would have calluses. You would have scars. You would know pain. You think you know pain? You think the society is an inevitable force of history? You think her the end of history? But many have thought that before. Many ruling classes have believed theirs to be the last, the pinnacle. They grew soft, fat. They forgot that calluses, wounds, scars, hardship preserve all those fine pleasure clubs you young boys love to frequent and all those fine silks and diamonds and unicorns you girls ask for on birthdays. In time... You will revive your scars from my sword, but first, you must earn them. Kyle, I bow down to you. You represent <laughs> why this book is so badass. We'll get into dialogue pros, yeah. but staying on characters because we need. There's so much we still need to get in, and this episode's long. I hope you guys like long episodes. So with with a, with the antagonist, I also have to give a shout out. We obviously can't go into every character, but why? This is so genius with its characters. I obviously love Daryl a lot more, so that's going to affect your rating. But what he does with all the side characters, I have to, I have to say this: he does the Howlers, the the group you're rooting for, that community, better than Sanderson does Bridge for. At least in book one, we'll just compare Way of Kings to this, for example. Mm -hmm. Even with how long Way of Kings is, Pierce Brown was able to effectively make me care for even the minorly mentioned characters. Now, here's someone like Quinn, for example, and I have this in my notes. Give me one second as I find where I put Quinn in my notes. Okay, so these small moments where he's able to attach us to the characters, with Quinn, for example. It's a simple paragraph where Darrow internally says, I like her. She killed a deer with a trap, then told a story about how she killed the thing with her teeth. Even showed us the evidence. Hair between her teeth and gums along with bite marks on the deer. We thought we had a prettier several on our hands till she laughed too hard to go on with the telltale. So it's something like that where it's just this little quirk of the character and also Quinn's the fastest of them and how that leads into the plot. That's all you need. Something super simple. Quinn's not an essential huge character in book one, at least I don't know what happens after. But then you also have the other character like Pax, who I, I gotta say, they're... The, we'll mention this in dialogue pros, but there's the hilarious balls line that we'll talk about there. But with Pax, this is his simple thing before he dies as well, where his internal dialogue, he says, Pax is a riot when you get him going. A surprisingly energetic talker with a penchant for complimenting everything in his stories, including the villains. So half the time you don't know who is good and who is bad. And then he tells this story about how he wanted to be an obsidian and about this love of his life, Helga, who had huge hands, th oh, sorry, thick fists and ample thighs. And just, it relates you to Pax and it goes, that's why he likes Darrow so much because he respects the heroes and villains, the guys that, you know, kick him and break his balls. So it gets you attached to these characters. You have, oh, we got to talk about Mickey in the beginning as well. Mickey, the how he says, he's the one that crafts and creates Darrow, changes him from a red to a gold, and how he looks at Darrow like a creation and calls him my boy. Almost like he's Pinocchio, a puppet that he created. How mm -hmm. fascinating is that? I I like all these characters you're talking about. I'm just not putting like nines out of out of here. Like I think they're all like pretty good. Okay. That that's okay. all I'm saying. Like I'm going like Pax is fine. You know, uh, Quinn is 
fine, I guess. Severo. Fine. Several's amazing. Uh, I think for these characters mm-hmm. and their page time, what what it's accomplishing is so amazing. And there's so much good to say about Severo. I mean, you might not like him as much, but Severo. I like him. I just didn't love him. I think he's fine. Listen, Severo is best boy, and here's the here's the line that shows who Severo is. Right mm-hmm. when he finds out, he finds Darrow is alive and Mustang their allies, and this is his best line by far. So Mustang asks to uh, says to Severo saying. I always wondered what sort of mad little fellows you howl- howlers were, Mustang says. Little? Severo asks. I I didn't mean to offend. He grins. I am little. Something like that just shows you like he takes it with pride that people think of him that way and that he can still show his toughness. It's just, I love all these characters, man. I love, I love the representation of Titus and Tactus and their message of the story showing the reds versus the golds. Roke, Cassius, we've mentioned a lot. Fitchner is a great character, and you have Tamara, Tamara, a small minor character. I feel like I have to name everybody here just to show. You have to justify your nine seven on characters. That's that's the thing. You got to name them. <laughs> I no, I have to because there's yeah. even the minor ones like Vixis, Nyla, Clown. So I'm mentioning all these because all of them felt so real in 125,000 pages. What else can I ask Again, for? Not pages. 125,000 words. Okay, 125,000 words. Words. Yes. That's what it is. Sorry, guys. It's okay. So, characters. Do you want to move on the plot? Yeah, let's move on the plot. Or did you want to? Do you want to end characters on a bad note just to get your two cents in? I uh, all the characters you talk about, I thought were pretty good. I didn't think they're amazing. It like I forgot most of them. I hate you. I'm just saying. <laughs> you might have the high ground, but I'm coming up there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, for plot, I gave a seven point five. I thought your it was highest good- one. Yeah, it's my highest one. I think the plot is actually really well done. I give it a 9-6. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. I This is the one portion. Now, obviously, I gave characters and emotional impact 9-8s because there's like minor things I won't even mention. It's so high. But mm-hmm. there's one thing in the plot that I actually disliked, and then I'm going to gush about it again. I want to see if you also dislike this. Actually, I think I know you do because we talked about this with the patrons. This is one of the points that was brought up. Mm-hmm. So I didn't like how when Cassius stabbed Daryl, at the end of part four, was it whenever that was in the book? I didn't like that scene because we already had a cut to black about to die at the beginning where he was getting hung and then escaped that. We had another stab cut to black where I, you know, he pulled the same trick twice. I also didn't like it because the motivation of Cassius would have been to kill Darrow because what Cassius, rather than what Cassius yeah. did to Titus, he destroyed Titus and showed that anger. Why didn't he do that to Darrow? Didn't make sense to me. So that's my one genuine complaint, and that's the only complaint you could have, okay? Well, also the whole Mustang being the Jackal's uh, sister. You didn't like that? Not as much. That didn't bother me. All I can say is like I could see how you don't like that trope, so no, nothing more yeah. to say than I liked it. Uh, but the first thing that has to be mentioned with plot, and by the way, this series, I have a feeling is going to be, I'm going to be talking 90%, I'm so sorry. It's just, you know, we have to have the more enthused one takes over, I guess, right? Yeah, no. It, do, you, do you mind that I'm like, hey, I'm look, gushing? I ear gush ear. on Wheel of Time. Fair. Plenty okay. of, this is your thing. I just got, That's fine. <laughs> if you feel like I need to slow down, you let me know. I'll let so, you know. So with the, the most incredible thing about this plot, and there's moments, there's a lot of moments to mention, and I will get into those. But the primary thing is the pacing. The pacing is, and there is 0.0% fluff in this book everything has a purpose i have never seen a better paced book and that doesn't just mean because it's fast paced so way of kings your stormlight your other books lord of the rings can be slow paced and have great pacing so you can have a really well paced slow paced book really well paced fast paced book this is the best fast paced paced book i've ever read (laughs) and it's incredible every chapter ends on i have to read more i have to turn the next page did you feel the same on the pacing of this book no actually so parts of it, oh. yes. I remember reading and going when it got to the Hunger Games part. So I was part one and all the infiltration, all that stuff going into the institution. And I thought that was the best part of the book for me. I love that too. Yeah. That was my favorite part. I thought it was well paced, all that. When we're going through Hunger Games, I kind of I kept remember going like, all right, how long is this going? Like, when are they getting back to like infiltration? I I didn't know this was just Hunger Games. I kept re- going back and going. And it's going on quite a bit. It's not the rest of the book. It's just Hunger Games. And I it felt a little robbed. Because I felt like I was promised something different. And pacing for me, I thought that was a, maybe a bit long. But that could have been my expectations going into the book. I think that's... Okay. 
if I was expecting it, I probably wouldn't have the same problem with it. So that's where a little iffy. I remember okay. telling you when we first started reading it, I actually put the expectations on you of like, it is like Hunger Games in space. I kind of like told you that. Well, the other thing on top of that is I really like Hunger Games. I think it's a great book. I love that arena battle royale trope. Mm -hmm. And so going into the book, knowing this is Hunger Games style, loved it. I mean, if it's not for you, it's not for you. It's that dystopian, put these young I, adults in. I don't mind it. It was just the first part of the book kind of set me up to, th I thought that there was going to be something else because it talked about the infiltration, the golds and all the stuff. Now I will actually talk about that. The second book fulfills the promise of part one of the first book. Everything that I wanted in the first book came through strong in the second. Everything I was missing, I was like, slow down and spoil this. I'm just saying, slow down. Book two knocks it out of the park. I'm going to be far more praiseworthy on book two. I flipped red, our new plushie, because you're gushing about a book I haven't read yet. Yep. And I saved it so that I could just talk about this book for this pod, and then I'm mm -hmm. going to read on immediately. Uh, so you didn't like the Hunger Games aspect, okay? I will say I came in with those expectations, and I also knowing that it's a trilogy, I could see how the whole point of the infiltration is you have to pass this big test, and that's the big test. I'm there for it. Just preferences, I guess. Like, what else yeah, can you say no, there? I, as a series and as a trilogy, I now look back going, like, I see why it was more necessary. Why you were wrong, right, right. Yeah, actually. <laughs> Genuinely, it's oh, why really? I was wrong. It was mainly how part one leads into it. I thought okay, a little more confusing, where I thought part one kind of promised certain things, and then by the end of the book, it was not delivered. Interesting. That's more specific. The delivery of the promise from part one came in book two. Okay. D don't, and so that, don't that's, all, that is that's all my confusion. For me, what was promised was, you know, the character of Darrow and just him being too rash and right which we don't want to get back into that discussion no, that, well at least we can agree on the rashness we can agree on the leadership qualities and that's mm -hmm. that's what i was in there for but as so as you didn't think it was incredibly fast paced because the hunger game bored you a bit yeah so coming with a different perspective i thought it was really well paced and there are so many moments i have to point out in this book just battles alone like talking about oh yeah the battles were what make a book right but it, it is important that this book fit into here has the mars internal fight Mars versus Ceres, Mars versus Minerva, Mars versus Diana. Then he's beaten. He have the Dark Knight of the Soul. All is lost when he gets stabbed by Cassius. Gathers up the army, fights Ceres again, fights Apollo, fights Jupiter, fights the Proctors, and then back to Mars again. There's just so many moments of compelling conflict. I mean, I, I, compelling is the wrong word for that. It's just badass. Where you have all these yeah. fights happening in these different castles, and I'm I love that stuff. But even beyond like the hey things hit things because I love my Mad Max. I love my Gladiator. Yeah. I love my Lord of the... the movies action, more so go into that, but... The action's good. Okay. I just think I've read better. So it's not the highlight for me. I thought we'll, it was We'll fine. get into that dialogue, pros. But as far as the plot goes, his transformation into being gold, that first part that you love so much, mm -hmm. extraordinary. And I got to play this next clip from, mm -hmm. from our guy here, the Kyle Derrick. This clip is, again, early on in the book, when Darrow is getting beaten and Eo's about to get beaten for being in that little pasture area mm -hmm. that they weren't supposed to go back in the mines. And this is the line that is said by Darrow. Kyle, take it away. No one is offended that I'm bloody and beaten. But when Eo is tried to top the gallows, there are cries, there are curses. Even now, she is beautiful, even drained of the light I saw in her three days ago. Even as she sees me and lets the tears come down her face, she is an angel. All this for a little adventure, all this for a night under the stars with the man she loves. Yet she is calm. If there is fear, it is in me, because I feel a strangeness in the air. Her skin prickles as they lay her across the cold box. She flinches. I wish my blood had warmed it better for her. I mean, I had to put so that... I, th I think that last slide is a little cringy for me, <laughs> but that's Really? Fine. Oh, just, I, I wish my blood had warmed, warmed it, it a little <laughs> warmer for her. That I don't know. That just kind of made me laugh a little what bit. What issue with it? I don't know. I just thought it was a little <laughs> cringy. That, that, is, that line right there is where I'm like, 
I could see YA dialogue. I could see that all kind of YA. Is it like some word in there or just the said? No, just like the concept of like, I wish my blood warmed their like her seat because uh, so, really? it's too oh, cold. Oh, wow. We just have completely different tastes in it. I think that's a great line. I, I mean, just I, looking at it, good. it look, well, looking at what the line... It's not particularly bad. I, I'm not saying that. It's just... It well, kind you said of cringy. <laughs> that's, that's bad. I guess. You're I walking guess. it back. <laughs> no, I don't know. It just, just that, genuinely makes me laugh a little bit. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I completely disagree. Just that line right there does so many multiple things. One, it just... The direness and dystopia of the situation. Dystopia's not even a word, is it? But the direness of the situation, and that's how low they are. He just wishes that the his own blood warmed it better for her. And showing how gritty the world is, continuing from chapter one up till now, it's already been that. It's a great line to show the tone of the book. It's really good, and it shows... It, the second thing it does on top of that is just a love yes for Eo. Even confirms that that anything I could do for her, literally, if my blood could warm it better, I would do anything for this woman. I think that does a lot for the story. But right. y- you know, you just you just shamed on the Kyle Derrick right there. You better apologize to the voice of God, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm surprised you said it's crazy, hey, but it's not it's not Kyle. It's, <laughs> it's Pierce Brown. No, I wanted to come on here for an interview. I don't know how I'd handle myself. I <laughs> no, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to handle I, myself. Hey. Pierce, can I call you Pierce? I'm just saying I gotta be negative because of him. If he wasn't here, I'd be singing more of your praises. I'm just saying Pierce, he called you I gotta There's gotta be a little give and give and take here. There's gotta be conflict on this show. Yeah, you're making good conflict. That's good. That's good. So uh I had to point that out because the inciting incident of this book, I am so hooked. I mean, from the first line of the hanging on Mars that we talked about earlier on, mm-hmm. his love for EO, EO dying. Inciting incident going to the transformation of gold, the Hunger Games, it's split up into it's such a well structured book, and every portion of it I can just think of incredible moments. I can't get over it. Oh wow. So do you want to go beyond plot or do you want to lead us off into another That's... negative tangent? <laughs> Let's go into dialogue. And dialogue and prose is cringy prose. <laughs> what did you give it out of ten? A five point five. I give it a nine point six. I, I think it's it's really average. It, it just, dude, that's what it is. I, I'm. I think Pierce Brown like ups his game by a significant degree in the following books. He becomes a, such a much, such a better writer just on pure writing ability alone. Five he and a half for this so one? much. Yeah, I, I've read I've read a lot of books that has the same writing it so has Patrick Leo the other booktuber and he says it was <laughs> I just say I, just, I've read I had kind of I had Patrick Leo as my backup the whole time so how I do on these uh <laughs> like how I judge writing and dialogue I'm mm-hmm. kind of looking through different elements uh, uh, uh always a standout is I'm thinking like how does if especially if it's a fantasy uh an action fantasy book how do they write action have I have I read action that's been written worse have I read action that's been written better and there's plenty of authors that write action way better, I think. It's improved upon in book two and three. But I, I was looking at like Joe Abercrombie. I think John Gwen writes action better. So there's these things. I'm kind of putting them average. Uh, when it comes to dialogue itself in world building, I don't get as clear a picture of the world when we're kind of walking around. He does a great job at describing the society. But when it comes to mental image, I, and I'm not I'm not seeing that detail to a certain, to the same degree, and that's mostly mostly due I guess to his style of it's kind of choppy choppy dialogue and really short cuts and not a lot of descriptive words. It's more of like the character says I'm mad rather than more description or they describe they go into a forest. They don't really describe the forest. It's just forest, and so. It's average. I've seen stuff that's been better. I've seen stuff that's worse. And I think he improves later on. So uh, from my perspective as someone who wants to write a book, I know you do too, but like, it's, I really want to write a book. That is my ultimate yeah. goal. Out of all the books I've read, this one taught me something I, I never learned before. That's great. And so looking at, well, th- this lesson's been there, but to see it done so masterfully. So obviously it's gritty. Mm-hmm. I think he has hilarious scenes between his characters, which actually make you laugh and connect with the character, which is hard to do in a book. It's efficient, but what he does best is the economy of words. The 
the lack of fluff, not just with his pacing, but with the pros, it's so direct and you're never questioning what it means. And all the, he uses adjectives, several adjectives throughout the book. I, I could, I'm not at the top of the head list what they are, but he makes some very provocative and provocative words to get you to feel what he wants you to feel. And I've just never seen it done. You said the choppy sentences is more of a negative or maybe just as a lack of preference. I well, found the, Yeah, the choppy mm-hmm. sentence kind of leads to a lack of mental picture of the world and the characters themselves. Fair. And so I, for example, Small Gods, which you think is like 9.5. Uh, yeah. I, I, so if I, I look at... That's the thing. I have to look at like... Yep. As some of the best that Terry writing Pratchett. can be, Terry Pratchett on just pure writing ability is master. I think Pierce Brown improves greatly, but he's about average in his just pure writing prose. So I think Terry Pratchett is masterful in nearly a 10 as well with his writing, just for what he's accomplishing. Pierce Brown the same. Just when you're mentioning these people like Joe Abercrombie, Brent Weeks, or anybody that you mention, I think you can have both of these people, what they're going for on their pedestal, both being masters at what they're doing. You could agree less with that, but it's like, I'd say it's similar to me looking at an animated film or a live action film and looking at the animated and the dialogue there I would rate differently from coming from mm-hmm. you know a kid's point of view or whatever versus an adult book or just like I would do with uh, a horror film than I would do with so different genres well, so to just, your point I yep. actually do want to compare then Red Rising to something like Black Prism and Brent mm-hmm. Weeks Black Prism is in similar way I think in pure writing style they are similar but Brent Weeks, I think, is a much better writer when he first starts out. The action it is short and choppy, but it is described better. It's more fluid. I, it's a much better action scene. When he describes the world, it's not flowy prose like Tolkien. It isn't that way. He does okay. a lot of similar things. Like They're in the same genre of that style. At, but I'm just saying, I think it's been done better. Would you say Pierce Brown is a worse writer than Sanderson? Like, what do you give Sanderson's prose? Higher yeah, than five I, and a half, I imagine? Higher, yeah. So this, but not, this is where we differ, right? Yeah. Because I think Pierce Brown and Sanderson are on the equal level, an equal footing. What he does is so mesmerizing with his dialogue. It, it's, I can't put it into words. He wrote this thing in two months, mm-hmm. and that makes it even more astounding to me that he was able to accomplish. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of editing afterwards that's not included in that writing of two months. Yeah. I can't explain what it elicited to, the, elicited to me. But there were so many laugh out loud moments. There were so many ah oh, moments that he was able to do in his dialogue and prose to get me to react emotionally as well. The choppiness and the quickness of it is not a negative in any term for me, at least. I think it's it's a show of his craft. I think the, that his ability to have the economy of words, the efficiency in his writing is even harder to do in some situations than making something sound more descriptive or than something Here's that the- sounds... It, you're right. Mm-hmm. It is a risk, though. You're, the economy of words means you have to be far better with your choice of words, and it means yeah. you don't have the luxury of wasting them, and you have to pick the perfect word. It's harder. I, I completely agree that mm-hmm. you're short, like the, the shorter the, the dialogue, the harder it is, I would say. I think others do it better. That's fair, but let's also get the Kyle Derrick to finish us off with his last two lines. And these are the dialogue pros we listened to already. I thought those were wonderful lines, but here are some more wonderful lines. This one is where Darrow is paying compliments to, he's becoming a better leader and he's paying compliments to his newfound group of people, the the outcasts that are going to rise up. Here we go. I pay each student a specific compliment. One they remember forever. Even when I am ruining their society at the vanguard of a billion screaming reds, They will tell their children that Darrow of Mars once clapped them on the shoulder and paid them a compliment. So that moment there, and I want to go on to the second moment. This is the last one from the Kyle Derrick. So after you guys listen to this, you can go off the video. I know you were here from him the whole time. This one is when they just took over Apollo and they're chanting Reaper. Like that, that Darrow was able to accomplish this and lead them into taking over Apollo and the Proctors. Here we go. The three proctors scatter after the pulse spear goes through their shielding. They turn to look at me. Fire glitters in their eyes, but the passion in me was not quenched by a mere spear throw. I hate these scheming fools. I will ruin them. Jupiter, 
You are next. You are next, you piece of dog shit. Then Pax bellows my name. And then Tactus's voice echoes it. Then Nyla from a far tower. And soon a hundred voices chanted throughout the conquered castle, from the courtyard to the high parapets and towers. They beat their swords and spears and shields, and then they throw them at the proctors. A hundred missiles thump harmlessly into pulse shields, and many of my army must scatter so that they are not impaled by the falling weapons. But it is a sweet sight, a sweet sound of metal rain on cobbled stone. And again, they take up my name. They chant and chant the name of the Reaper of the Proctors because they know whom we now fight. Gotta say, Kyle improves this this dialogue to a significant degree. Kyle, Kyle, what, do you, Kyle his, what do you gotta say, Kyle? Woo! Getting spicy up in here. I like it. Thank you, gentlemen. Until the next time. The Kyle Derrick out. Bye, Kyle. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle, you've done wonders. Thank you for reading one of my new favorite books. So this that's incredible. And the dialogue and prose, we're just going to disagree on the, the shortness yeah. of it. But I do want to point out some things here with the hilarity of it and the gutturalness of it. So the some hilarious parts for me are were Cassius at one point, you know, they're in the they're in the lake or they're they're going in the lake and Mustangs over there and they're stuck. And they're freezing, and so Mustang. Sorry, Cassius goes. M- Mustang is a se- sex p- p- pot, and Darrow says she's scary. Darrow's like sexy, no, she's scary. And Cassius says she reminds him of his mother. And Darrow goes, something's wrong with y- you. And so it's just so weird and funny. And then you have another scene where uh, no one, no one knew where Several was. Remember at the beginning with all mm-hmm. Titus, Antonia, and you had Cassius, Darrow's faction. No one knew where Several was, and they kind of joked around saying like. You know, he's probably wanking in the woods. That's what Severo is doing. And Severo, when Severo saves them out of the water from that Mustang scene we just went over, so, um, they're like, Severo, we, like, Severo knew, knows where House Minerva is. That's where he was. And Severo says, Severo snorts, what do you think I've been doing this whole time, you silky turd, wanking off in the bushes? Cassius and I look at each other, uh, kind of. I say, yeah, actually, Cassius agrees. <laughs> and then another hilarious point where Darrow's going to fight Pax, and he goes, uh, and this, so this is what Pax says. This is the big fight after he already kicked his balls in. They're attacking. And Pax says, jump, jump, little grasshopper. He grumbles. It'll, let, it'll be the last time you use your, you use your legs. Uh, what's that? I ask. I said it'll be the last time you use your legs. Odd, I mutter. He blinks at me and frowns. What's odd? You sound like a girl. Did something happen to your balls? You little. And then another hilarious scene that's referencing it. I get the camaraderie and it just makes me feel so much for the characters. And on top of that, do you want me to keep going or should we move on? Go ahead. I, I just want to point out yeah. that uh, Kyle does a much better job reading these lines than you. I just want to say. I know that our <laughs> plushy red is already on sad face. I'm flipping it to happy and back to sad. You're right. Because you know I'm right. Yeah, I know you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh. And I'm just being mean, pointing out the obvious. Kyle, that, that, wasn't oh. nec- that wasn't necessary, but I felt it was. It, it made me feel good to point out the obvious. No, that, that was fair. That's a very fair point. So <laughs> uh, we can move on from this, but just the, it, I love his dialogue and prose. That's yeah, what it comes I, I think to. we're going to disagree on that, and I'd be interested to see what you think of the next book. Because I think his... Because I'd be interested to see if you think his writing significantly improves in book two, or do you think it's about the same? Okay, we'll Because see. personally, I think it, just on a pure skill level, I think he improves sure. a lot in his second book. That gotcha. The writing is just so much better. Well, so I, okay. I'm very positive gotcha. <laughs> later on. I'm not going to be such a negative Nancy. That'll be two. good. Next next one we do on this, on what Golden Sun is the next one, mm-hmm. we'll be We'll together. be doing that pretty quickly because he's obsessed now, so. Like, obsessed. Yeah. It's Fierce Brown, you beautiful man. <laughs> Let's move on to world building. World building magic, what'd you give it out of 10? I gave it a 7. We've talked... Uh, I give it a 9.7. Dang. <laughs> what'd you expect? All these are high. <laughs> I, I, I know, it's just always... It's always surprising to me. Really? This is one of the higher scores for me, mainly because I think Pierce Brown does a great job setting up the hierarchy in in the in this fictional you know sci-fi world 
and it's such an interesting point of like you see all these stories about hierarchies with they're artificial it's just an artificial like oh yeah the nobles and then the peasants and there's effectively no difference it's just you know how hierarchies used to work on earth basically but this one is very different from how uh, our own world works where the hierarchies in red rising are actually physically there like instead of just stereotypes being just a racist thing it's a literal thing here like the fact that gold being on top of the hierarchy yeah they are smarter stronger faster <laughs> like they are all of these things they're taller they're huge you can't beat them like all of those things that makes a very interesting point and makes augustus Augustus talking about how, why the golds are in charge and how they stay in charge by actually challenging their young and making culling the weak, all this stuff. It's very interesting. Uh, I like the reference to the scar, the whole idea of the golds getting a scar, which is kind of a not Nazi thing, but a Germanic um, cultural thing that the Nazis actually took over and the SS actually used to do that themselves where they would deliberately get scarred or scar themselves to kind of show their strength and it was a elitist cultural thing. Anyway, so I got I got that reference. I like all that. So I think that's really cool. Nice. Yeah, I, I was that's my positive stuff to say. I was gonna say that so the hierarchy, I couldn't agree more. I obviously I agree with all the good things you're gonna say. Yeah. And I wanna point out some specific things I loved about it and they go broader but a specific thing I loved to show us how the golds act was he had to learn to leave 20% of his fish so that leave 20% of his fish on the plate so he didn't make his taste buds slaves to the food just to show their culture where it was about self-control don't mm -hmm. overindulge you know you can have your vices but don't let it usurp control over you it's very important in the golds culture and that's so fascinating, just that little scene of how they eat. I, you never, that's such a unique world building tool. And I never think too much when I'm reading a book, like, ah, how's that culture eat? And that's so, so fascinating to me. And the way that Darrow navigates through the goals of him being rash and more, okay, not rageful, I'll say angry, I guess. So the way that that's actually encouraged and mm -hmm. showing the pride of the culture done so well and intertwined with the plot of the book. And I got to say, the best part about the world building is how the info dumps were disguised so well. Where the Augustus speech we heard that we heard earlier on in this episode where he's discussing what you're doing going into this institute, why the institute exists, why are you flipping the, the red plushie? What? We're green. Oh, look at that. Okay. I like the world so building. It's good. The info dumping on that, I wouldn't even, it's such a well disguised info dump where Augustus is rightfully explaining to these new initiates what they're going into mm -hmm. and you hear why why they're doing this and them looking back to the other conquered nations in the past and i always love it's one of my i love this trope of when earth is mentioned and you or, or like the united states and how it's in the past tense and i'm like oh how did the u.s fall it was probably because like you took over and then ruined everything that's i'm assuming i can see it yep yep you definitely be like hey I'd like, run, what would, how would you ruin the U.S.? I'd run the country into, gra into the ground, but I would do it in a very glorious way. You would, it would, I would get a solid chapter uh, of the history textbook. Not a footnote. I would be a whole chapter. It all ended when Richard started requiring people to read Hyperion, and people killed themselves. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's my hot take of the day. That's, oh, you're so wrong on that. <laughs> Hyperion was fine. It's it's eh. it's masterful. It's bad. It's, it's, bad. it's, bad. it's fine. It's uh, you'll see my official review when we do Hyperion. <laughs> but I love that that was this guy so well showed what why their culture does this and how they have the quality control and they they emulate people like the Spartans and are against the democracy of Athens. So so great. actually a more. It, I think it's. It's only hinted on in this book, but I think it get it gets more interesting later on. Is the stunted growth of their culture? How don't please don't go too far into that. Well, this me. is just book one. Okay, is how fascinating is it that the golds and their hierarchy is based a lot on Roman culture and that their art and that their system of governance and their words that they use are based off of 
ancient civilizations. And that's they aspire to the past. It's a it's a culture constantly looking at the past, never looking forward. And I think that's interesting. interesting. That's an interesting thing about the whole world. And you kind of pick that up on because on a surface level, like, oh, cool. You know, I love all the, you know, Roman uh, terms and all this. It's cool. But then you kind of think to yourself, like, this is the far future of Earth and their terminology. All these things is looking back to the ancient right. past. How weird is that? Like, that's very strange. We don't do that now. <laughs> like, like, yeah, we, we kind of reference stuff in the past, but it's not like we're basing our entire culture off of a culture thousands of years ago. We have our own culture. They have none of their cultures their own. It's just an amalgamation of cultures from the past. That's fascinating. And it makes the Hunger Games aspect, the arena, make so much sense with the world. And I, I think this is why it blows Hunger Games out of the water, although I liked it. It takes that arena aspect, and what it does is it instead of taking these district kids as f- play toys for the capital, the elite, yeah. the elite, this is the elites themselves, their children, who Doing are here to, yeah. n- to continue their function as a society because they all believe this. And this is the way that we don't become weak. And on a, on a certain level, it makes complete sense. It You can understand the antagonists, the villains of the story. You can understand it, and you go, wow, what a fascinating culture. Well, also even more so, you understand why the golds are in charge. Like, how have yeah. the golds stayed in charge all the hundreds and hundreds of years? Yep. How, how, like, how has there not been a more successful revolution? Yeah. Because how oppressive they are. No, you get it. They, they, they are not resting on their laurels they're all and which one makes the golds a far more intimidating set of villains yes and antagonists really like how are the reds going to beat them yeah you have all the reds are physically weaker physically weaker but also mentally the whole thing of oh oh yeah you could learn the golds learn yeah darrow in a night read what three thousand history books Mm -hmm. because he was able to do that with the tech and being a gold yeah like what so that whole, I give so much credit to that transformation of him being red to a gold with Mickey, Dancer, and all of them, showing so much about the culture and him learning what he has to do. And even before that, the fact that the Reds don't know about the rest of the world is a great world-building hook. Yeah. I am immersed. The, it's funny, the only complaint I had about the world was one thing you mentioned earlier, that you really love the hierarchy thing. I think the hierarchy is great. The, the gold, red, I understand it. Some of the ones in between... I didn't understand where they place in the hierarchy, at least in book one. I went, get I, I, I get you, but at least book one, I was like, oh, where's that? Okay, I got a little tidbits. It would have been 10 out of 10 if I got more of that, but 9.7, I yeah, I loved it. I've never seen such a creative world. Yeah, I, my, okay, I shouldn't my say points, that. There's a lot of creative worlds. It's just a really great world. My points mentioned before where I don't have as good of a mental image of the world itself I, and that's just kind of a lot of it comes down to writing choice and how he describes it and how he writes the book. So I'm not giving it mainly above a seven man because of that. I just don't see the world very well. I, I, I see okay. the culture really well. That's great. But the world itself and the physicality of it, not as much. This you're not going to agree. This isn't going to change your mind. But I did like this brief description of the vegetation looks like green scars cut across her poke surface. Water and impact craters forming grand lakes, um, and I butchered that because I extended it and like two. So, anyways, that it was that, but said a little mm. bit differently. But explaining that was really nice. I love the map in this, showing me where all the places are that I could follow along. I love a good map. I love a good fantasy a, map. A lot of great things to say. I like the peerless guard versus the graduates versus how you get shamed. Mm-hmm. Lovely world, and I'm the reason I give it so high as well is my anticipation going to the next book. I'm, I want to learn more about the world. I am invested in this. It's, and I also give bonus points in worlds and magic systems. Well, this doesn't really, I guess it's just world. It's a sci-fi, world. so it's not really magic system. But w- I give huge bonus points to a world that don't overbear you with unnecessary fillage. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't try to show off its world in a way of, he stays contained in the focus of the story. I think that makes a great world and makes it deeper. So I understand the golds. I understand the reds. I'm involved, and I'm sure it'll expand from there. Mm-hmm. And I just got to say, 
Red Rising, thank you for existing. Pierce Brown, thank you so much. Thank you for letting me talk so much this episode as well. I appreciate of course. it. And I think we got our buddy Red here. I'm going to turn him toward me because we know he has a favorite. And if you've gotten this far into the podcast, which I don't know how long it's even running. Oh, I can tell point. you right now. Let's see. It's about uh, over an hour and a half again. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Comment down below. Um, there's always another mountain. Because just like I was going to have to make book, him move. <laughs> uh, you know that Hannah Montana song? No, I don't. What? I, I watched that movie in theaters with my buddy. Oh, it's a great movie. Oh, yeah, that buddy wasn't me. Oh, I was going to have to Comment, make there's always move. another mountain because <laughs> Golden <laughs> Sun is going to be that mountain for you. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. So you want to wrap it up? Oh, it's the climb. That's, oh my that's the song. It's the climb. I was looking for the name of the song the whole time. It's the climb. You know, change that. Um, comment down below, Hannah Montana, if you've gotten down this. Demonetized. Long. I think we're gonna demonetize. All right. Don't don't worry. They only demonetize you if the song is recognizable and your singing ability is not good enough for I, it to be recognized. I saw it coming. I saw it coming. It still hurt. It still hurt. <laughs> uh, thank you guys. Thank right. you guys and gals for watching. We appreciate it. Bye bye, y'all. All right. <laughs>